All right, here we are. Welcome everybody to the Vitality Project Lockdown. This is our, our debut collaboration between myself and Bob Weathers, <clears throat> excuse me, and my dear friend Kara Bear <laughs> Durant from South Africa. It's wonderful to have you uh, here with us, Kara. And I'm gonna have you introduce our guest. Amy, I'm so happy to meet you and I'll let Kara introduce you. And then let's see where we want to go. The topic, is gender-based violence as kind of the umbrella topic and uh, uh, not only in South Africa but in the world. I'm in the U.S. You guys are in South Africa. We're addressing a human problem across the globe and it's historical. Its roots run deep but it's very contemporary as we'll soon find out in our conversations with Kara and Amy. And so um, I want to uh, thank both of you uh, for your patience in joining me via technology, but I'm also really honored to have both of both of you here um, with the Vitality Project and really happy to link with you, Kara, with Lockdown Open Up. And so you can say a word about that and then introduce Amy. And I'd love, uh, love to host you, Amy, in any way that's uh, useful. Really, that's my wish, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kara, yeah. Thanks so much for um, this opportunity to partner both of our Things that um, you know we both feel strongly about. I think you and I both identified with our concept of trying to hashtag break the stigma yeah. <laughs> of, of shame mm. and um, everything associated with um, the things that stop us from opening up about um, yeah. yeah things that we've been suppressing for so long. Yes. And, um, Yes, ironically, yes. After, after the last conversation or the last chat we had, um, our president, President Ramaphosa, um, addressed our nation, which has been happening less frequently these days. Um, and uh, in addition to highlighting our phased out lockdown um, news, uh, he also addressed a very big uh, crisis, the, another pandemic. Um, in South Africa, which has been going on way beyond uh, COVID. But of course, as we all know, lockdown and COVID-19 has been a catalyst for so many other problems. Awesome. Um, yeah. And in our country, um, I was actually looking at statistics today um, that before COVID-19, uh, in South Africa, a woman is murdered every three hours. And um, as far as uh, gender-based violence go, um, I think South Africa is ranked in the highest, one of the highest countries in the world uh, for gender-based violence with as many as 51% uh, of women having experienced violence at the hands of someone that they know and trust. Um, and these are only cases that are being yeah. reported. Yeah. So yeah. I think, with that care, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is why aren't these things being reported? And when Ramaphosa addressed this in his State of the Nation address, and as Amy pointed out yesterday in my interview with her, he's addressed this a few times, and in September he addressed it as well. But with the platform of COVID, the whole country is listening. Um, it's uh, obviously an opportunity now for everyone to uh, voice out other things and ask the question, why are things not being reported? Why are things not being done? And, and again, what came to mind is stigma and shame. And Ramaphosa addressed that, that we need to do something about it. Um, and whether the government will actually actively do what they say they will do to help the problem is, remains to be another conversation. But, we can't all sit and wait for government to do things and there are things in our own capacity that perhaps we could be doing more of and um, we need to look at what is stopping us from uh, being able to um, a uh, open up and find safe spaces to maybe get help about something that might have happened years ago or something that might have happened recently in lockdown or before lockdown and b to report it What's stopping us from reporting it? Uh, where's the problem there? Um, Amy can also touch on that. Um, and yeah, so all, all, all these things that are that are counteracting um, this whole effort to um, uh, destigmatize. Um, 
And with gender-based violence, I thought it was a good way to highlight, um, you know, because I mean, the stigma of, of shame and embarrassment um, is all encompassing for so many other areas. I mean, it goes beyond gender-based violence. It's again, plowing back to addiction and recovery, which ironically, I mean, I didn't actually know Amy before yesterday's uh, conversation. And through uh, her opening up to me about her story with this, and Amy has been trying to speak her truth for the last four years in court, um, so I want, I was very keen to chat to her because I know that for her, having to speak your truth about something um, for four years um, must be quite, quite a, quite a, a yeah, um, to literally fight your case. Um, so I was very keen to chat to her about that, but, um, and explore that. But we discovered that a lot of it comes back to, again, um, the tools that we use in recovery uh, to 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 authentically um, speak our truth and face our fears uh, of shame and embarrassment or the things that aren't so comfortable to speak about in order to recover um, from whatever it is that uh, we are trying to heal from. So uh, that video is on the lockdown open up group. Um, and we'll be and we'll be putting it here if it's not already here. I want everyone. It's mandatory that everyone view your interview, Amy. Uh, it's yeah. really I want every yeah. single person that, yeah. to, to. And view. I want to say thank you as well to Amy for for doing that. Oh my that, gosh! Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a brave thing yeah. to do, and um, yeah, I know Amy because Amy is still in court over it. We haven't gone into the finer details of her story, and we've spoken around it, and rather taken inspiration from um, the tools and things. As I said, how she's used uh, recovery from addiction. And she's got her own story about that um, to heal from this process. So yeah. I will hand it over uh, to, to Amy in that discussion. Um, yeah, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, um, thanks for having me. This is yeah, a really amazing opportunity, I think. Um, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, because I'm under oath, I obviously can't do as many things as, um, you know, I've got a very loud mouth. I would love to like tell everybody in the world what's going on and how the system is, you know, it's, there's so many issues with it, but um, I'm really glad I found this space that I can, you know, chat to you guys um, without kind of fear of it, you know, without, as you said yesterday, you know, not going into the finer details, but kind of the outcomes of what's happened to me and how that's, you know, how I've moved on. So, um, Dr. Bob, I don't know, you don't, you don't know much about me, but... Uh, All I know is the 40-minute interview, and I realize that, that that's a huge piece of your life. As you said, it's a pivot point, but there's all the rest of you that I don't know, so I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, honestly, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so um, I'm 35 years old. I lived, uh, I've lived in Cape Town pretty much all my life. My family immigrated from England when I was uh, very young, okay. Okay. and uh, I'm a single mom, so I have a 10-year-old son as well. Um, which, as I mentioned, is why I'm locked into my, mm -hmm. my bedroom at the moment. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I am a recovering addict, and I also happen to be a rape victim. So it's kind of like all of those things um, make up who I am. Uh, and it's interesting because what I found is that the more that I've opened up about, specifically about the rape situation, is that it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy is that it tends to dominate what people know about me. So very often, you know, I haven't seen people in a while and they'll go, it's the only thing that they know about me now, you know, is that I'm this rape victim and that I'm in this court process. And it's almost like that kind of has kind of taken over my life for the past four years, which is quite interesting. Um, so it'll be interesting when the trial eventually ends, you know, like yeah. what's left after that. So I think that'll be quite an interesting process, but um I consider myself quite um, quite lucky when we were chatting about the stats uh, just before. Um, I think I read somewhere that only nine out of a hundred reported rapes in this country make it to trial. Um, and I am luckily one of those nine um, that have mm -hmm. made it to the point of trial. Um, often they get stuck at sort of the kind of the police or the prosecutor drop it due to lack of evidence. Do you, um, a real yes. quick question. Sorry to interrupt you, Amy. Do you or Kara happen to know in South Africa, probably is similar in the U.S., what percentage of rapes are reported? Do you have any information on that? Either intuitively or, or if you're aware of any statistics. So nine out of, t nine out of 100 make it to court. 
I wonder how many don't get reported. I can imagine it's the vast majority, but I, I it's not my expertise, so I don't know. Mm. Do you have a um, sense? I'll, could... I'll post it below this video afterwards because I had it in that recent um, okay. that kind of interview that I yeah. sent you, but Thanks. I'll post it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's something that um, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, I'll yeah. expand on that after this. Yeah, Amy, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you said no. that, I was struck by not only are you, are you the nine out of a hundred, but then you're the small group that even reported it. And so it's down to a really infinitesimally small oh, yeah. group that you're representing, which gives me the cold chills because it's so disturbing. You know, please yeah. continue. Yeah, please continue. And they, yeah. and they say out of those a hundred, um, one out of the hundred that get reported is falsely accused. So, you know, there's all this talk that, um, you know, people use, okay. use the system yeah. to, yeah. Yeah. to uh, as a malicious thing. Um, yeah. one out, out of those hundred, wow. one is a, is a false wow. accusation. Wow. Right with well. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If I may, I just wanted to, um, about the cases that don't get reported and other variables around it, apart mm -hmm. from shame and stigma, in South Africa, we've got... Um, there's culture silence. So in a lot of our traditional uh, cultures, um, I was listening to you again on that on that panel interview that um, in some of our cultures, uh, the woman marries the man and at the wedding, a uh, woman sits down with grandmother, grandmother says to wife, uh, you are now the wife and uh, you must obey. Um, and no matter how awful it gets, uh, you, you will take it. Um, and they, they're just conditioned that way. They believe that this is their role to fulfill whatever it husband's needs. The other variable is, is financial. And in a lot of our um, you know, poverty stricken areas where a matter of putting food on the table for your children is of far more importance than the money that you need in order to get out of your rural area to get transport in order to go and lay a charge at a police station. It is far more important to survive um, and put food yes. on the table for your children. Unfortunately, and in our rural areas, a lot of the time, the closest police station is miles and miles away. Yeah. And then there are other factors um, Mm -hmm. there's arguments about I mean it depends which area and and which which city and which mm -hmm. police department but there's our, our police forces as well there's so many variables around why a lot of cases aren't being reported and then of course your thing about stigma and shame and then a lot of the time there's fear genuine fear for your life and again this is where uh, there are very um few gender-based violence survivors um, and a lot of murders that happen and Rama, President Ramaphosa listed the 21 murders that happened during lockdown on women and children associated with gender-based violence and that's the reality of our situation in South Africa and and you know I feel it is important to point that out when we when we are talking about the differences between certain situations unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, I think we often get uh, told, um, we hear so many ho horrific stories about uh, women being raped and murdered in this country that the idea of rape, in, well, certainly it was in my head before it happened, was that you would get dragged off the street mm. and it would happen in a very scary environment and you would be left for dead. And in my case, it was someone that I knew and that I invited into my home. So it was completely... Yeah. Uh, it was completely opposite to what I had, the image I built in my head. Um, and it's funny, it was funny talking about, um, you know, kind of the different, the different aspects that affect it, because a lot of times people have said to me, oh, but you're so lucky because it, because it could have been so much worse. You oh, know, God. like I'm, like I'm a lucky rape victim mm -hmm. because I didn't yeah. get dragged into a bush mm -hmm. or left on the side of the road, you know, and it's, and, and yes, in a sense, yes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't devalue my trauma mm -hmm. or or the fact that justice needs to, you know, see, see how it's played. Yeah, Amy, I've got a question for you here. Why the fuck? <laughs> you know, why would people say that? I mean, I understand that it's human, but what is that about? That somebody would say to you how lucky you are that you that worse didn't happen. Do you have any thought? And Carrie, you too. I'm just curious. Um, Amy, you've you've been on the receiving end of this. Why why is why would people mm. say that? I, I've received a lot of. Uh, we chatted briefly about it yesterday. I've received okay. a, a lot of strange comments um, over the years. Less so now, yeah. because I'm so much more confident in it, as opposed to at the beginning when I was still 
um, I hadn't told my family and, you know, I, I wasn't really telling the publicly mm -hmm. telling people. And I think it's because mm. I think it's because the topic of rape makes people very uncomfortable. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a topic people don't want to discuss on on a person to person basis you know so even if i am chatting to someone nowadays where i'm you know i'm very open about my rape but if i'm mm -hmm. chatting to someone that i don't know i'll say instead of saying oh i'm testifying in my rape case i'll say oh i'm a, i'm a witness in a criminal trial wow. um because i don't want them to feel uncomfortable because if you say oh yeah. you know i've got my rape case you know on friday they get very uncomfortable so yeah. it's more Yeah. Um, yeah. it's just I think that word holds so much weight especially in this country that people and because this picture of like very violent rape is so is publicized every day you know and I'm seen as and and I acknowledge I'm in a very very privileged situation um mm -hmm. you know I you know I've obviously got a good career um mm -hmm. I've got a, an amazing home I've got a child there's lots of people who don't have kind of the privilege that I do um and so often it's like you're okay you know it could have been much worse you know, Do you know dr Bob, i think it might be the same as when people say um i used the example last time why are you in recovery what are you in recovery for when uh, i'm in recovery as uh, someone who survived an addict household i'm not necessarily recovering from being addicted to substance abuse although in other forms yes um and the, yeah thank you for pointing that out amy because it's again it's it's lack of education And um, and I think that social media has a lot to do with this and people voicing things uh, publicly with, without guided and professional mm -hmm. framework, which is why it's so important that we have these conversations openly, which is what I, I love that we're doing, but mm -hmm. facilitated by someone like Dr. Bob or someone who uh, has qualified and credited knowledge and experience in this in this sort of thing. So Thanks, it's all in okay. it's Thank not you. just um, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not just an ideological sort of um, yeah. 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 People... Something that you and I have talked about, Kara. I, I and I want to press a little bit further with this, if it's okay with you, Amy, uh, just for clarification. Uh, 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 I don't know if you know this, Kara. I'm in recovery also from severe addiction, and so I'm completely out with that. I'm very aware of the stigma here in the U.S. I don't live in South Africa, but I can imagine be the same there. But it's taken me a long time to get to where you can ask me anything about my addiction history, and I'll basically say it. Um, and it took me a long time to get to that place because I feel like it is a value. I'm right with you, Amy, that the secrets we bear are the source of our illness. You know, Having said that, I'm very aware, and Carrie, you and I have talked about this, whether it's coming from a family with addiction, as you did, uh, or, or coming out of addiction personally, which I have, I'm very aware of the stigma around it. And because I'm, it's not my front yard in terms of my clinical work or expertise, I'm interested to know from both of you What is it about rape that draws such stigma? Now, I'm a human being, and I can imagine, but I'd rather hear from you guys. I understand with addiction, the idea is that people typically assume that if I'm addicted, I chose for that. And so it, it's like, okay, you know, Bob is obviously a fuck up. He's an addict, and shame on him. Rape is so counterintuitive for me because it's being, it's, it's a violence that's perpetrated on somebody, yet people don't want to talk about it. So just any comments you'd have about that, why it's kind of the unspeakable I, I don't know um, on a sort of a, a more general level, but I know and it's, it's so funny how mm -hmm. my addiction stuff and, and the rape stuff kind of oh, all yeah. mesh together at the makes same so time. Makes so much sense to me. Absolutely, Amy. Yeah, yeah it makes so and, much and, sense. And yeah. ironically, I wasn't actually drunk when it happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and, 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 and the reason afterwards that I didn't tell anyone was mm -hmm. because I was worried they were going to say I was drunk and that I brought it upon myself. So I was worried that it would be brought under the category of Amy, Amy's drinking behavior rather yeah. than a problem by itself, which is, yeah. it was a very separate problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I didn't initially tell anyone because my parents for years have had, um, have always said that I've had, I've had issues with drinking and alcohol and yeah. I, subconsciously knew it but I was in denial for, for a while for, for sure. a long time yeah. <laughs> um mm -hmm. and and at that and at that time um I wasn't in recovery yet so for me personally it was just 
it was because I was so worried that people would be like, well, there, that's exactly what happens when you drink too much, you know, even though that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know from, I don't know, um, Kara, if you have a suggestion. Let me, let me say a word definitely. with that, that, that if, you, if you or I or anybody was drunk, it still doesn't excuse the violence, does it? Correct. But, but people Correct. will look for some way to kind of manage it. And if they can blame you, it helps them organize their anxiety versus, versus well, she was sober, so we can't do that. Let's see what else we can pick about her. You know, That's it's just exactly so it. crazy exactly making, it. it seems like to me. Um, yeah. Uh, hang with me for just a second, Kara. I want to stick with this question. So what is it about rape? Is it the fact that it is so offensive to us that we can't bear it to hear about it, to talk with you about it? What, what is it about us as human beings? In addition to the impulse to want to like blame somebody, especially if you've been drinking now, it's your fault, which is bogus and you and I both know that. But, but what, is it about, what is it about this? Again, I, I see it with addiction, but when you're on the receiving end of somebody's perpetrating violence, why wouldn't I respond with compassion and curiosity in the sense of help me understand your experience rather than I don't want to talk about it. You can be a witness at somebody's trial, but don't tell me that you're in a rape trial because I can't talk about it. It's like, why is that so incredibly unspeakable? I think it's because, and I think it's, uh, sorry, do you want to go? No, go I think, um, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud mm -hmm. here, is that I think in the same, if we use rape and addiction, uh, mm -hmm. as the, you know, if we look at both of those examples, when yeah. it comes up, what, it, what I feel it does is it, it makes people internally reflect on, you know, so rape culture isn't just, it doesn't start with someone raping someone. It starts yeah. at people yeah. sharing mm -hmm. pornography on their phones mm -hmm. or making sexist jokes. And it builds up. I mean, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, that yeah. triangle, but um, I haven't I haven't seen it. What is the triangle? I haven't seen it. Haven't seen. It talks about behaviors that eventually lead to okay, serious um, gender-based violence. And it all starts got at like it, base got level got of, Thank of you. stuff here. Yeah. Um, and in the same way with addiction, you know, when I when I started telling people that I was actually in recovery, um, I think it made them reflect on their own using behavior. Um, so a lot of people drink a bottle of wine a night you know and for me to go you know well I was drinking a bottle of wine a night and I'm now an addict and now I'm in recovery then they yeah. they like but am I an addict yeah. you know yeah. and so yeah. my my intuitive feeling is that it's linked to some kind of inward thing that makes okay. them uncomfortable because then they thank project you. it out but I, I mean I could that's, be wrong completely. it's very useful thank you that's really insightful I appreciate that that's got to be some element of it it may not be all of it or even the biggest piece but that one makes a lot of sense to me I've had so many people that I used to drink with and party with say you did didn't have a problem, Bobby. <laughs> it was like because I did the same amount that they did. It became really a problem for me, and I don't judge other people. I don't it, if it's not a problem for them, it's not a problem. But they certainly have a problem with it being a problem for me. <laughs> Kara, yeah, I, I you were going to say some things, Kara. Yeah. No, I do. I do think that um, there's a when you compare having to uh, I, um, disclose open up uh addiction versus uh rape um i think that addiction can a lot more people could relate to that perhaps it's all inclusive of both sexes um it, as far as uh being on the receiving end and yeah and with w when it comes to rape and i'm not saying i mean men can be raped too but in this case with um, violence against women yeah. um yeah when someone like you is speaking out and saying this is not okay this is what happened this is my truth uh i am now setting an example as well to other women here is me uh um standing up for myself for four years you are now making other women hopefully <laughs> um identify with that and go look at the bravery of this girl if she can do that for four years on a public platform um it doesn't mean you have to go and tell the whole story but just doing what you're doing you're also possibly making some men think back <laughs> to that drunken night or whatever and they're going to get in within themselves some sort of uh, guilty conscience perhaps i'm not I don't, I don't want to get into a whole argument about it because I know there's 
you know, some men don't like to be labeled in a certain thing in, of past crimes, but there is that, and that, uh, that uncomfortable feeling that will now sit with um, people and it's where, how do we now, where do we draw the line as far as what would constitute as that? And yeah, so I think it's that. I think if, you, if we're comparing it with what's making this more uncomfortable to talk about as, as, than addiction, I think it's that it's, this is not at the moment as all inclusive as addiction is. But I remember, I mean, addiction, when I as growing up in, in an in addiction environment, mm -hmm. it wasn't as comfortable for me to speak about when I wanted to get help. I didn't feel that I could have open conversations about yeah. addiction with just anyone or to yeah. be able to speak to people about what it was like uh, where the people around me were doing crazy drunken addictive things all the time. But now a days, especially, thank you, COVID, um, we're having all these, people are, are letting the stuff out. We have to, because it's, I mean, like we said last time, the world has gone batshit crazy. Um, and thankfully there's a lot more online open groups where we're speaking about addiction. Everyone's addicted to something and we're all recovering from something. Hopefully one day, thanks to people like you, Amy, um, who are able to find spaces and ways to make conversations like this, not that it ever should be a comfortable thing to speak about, and it shouldn't, but ways to open up uh, in facilitated, uh, guided environments, um, get access to the right spaces to do that. Maybe we can help break the stigma that way and it can become as accessible as talking about addiction and recovery. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Amy, Amy, further further thoughts in response to Kara or just where you were going? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think um, I think something I mentioned yesterday and again, how closely linked recovery and this rape healing process has been for me is that I don't think that I could have um, made it to where I am in my in my trial and uh, testifying and four years later and so on without being in recovery um it's 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 fundamentally changed i think i said in the in the call yesterday even if i've told my sponsor many times even if i didn't have an issue with substances i wish i had done the 12 steps years ago just the way that <laughs> my brain works and um you know the, the core principles of sort of um so i follow the na program um and you know I, I am so confident that if I hadn't been in recovery that I would not be at four years of my trial because it would have been over from the get-go. You know, I would have given up. Um, I wouldn't have been able to testify as, as you know, as confidently as I am now. Um, so I, I really think that recovery has given me the tools and the coping mechanisms to be able to speak out and be this open and confident. I don't think I would be like this if I, uh, if I wasn't in recovery. It just took it took the rape to be the kind of catalyst to get me to rock bottom to then climb my yeah. way back out. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. it took it. Yeah, I really, really resonate with both of you guys. I loved the interview. And this is one piece of it, it was towards the end that you you began to share this, this part. And Kara, you had some ways of putting it too that were really uh, dear to me. Um, I, I'm I'm with you, Amy. When I and I and 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 Carrie, you have your own your own experience with this too. My own getting into recovery about ten years ago, where I finally tried to when I finally was aware that I need to try to stop trying to moderate my addictive behaviors. I couldn't moderate shit. Um, <laughs> is that when I got into recovery and I I for me it started with AA and then eventually I got involved in refuge recovery, which is more mindfulness based. But and and I've had you know a lot of engagement over the years in it, and this has become my work. Is that it becomes a metaphor for living our lives, doesn't it? You know, it's it's. Um, I, in fact, my wife and I started a meeting in our home when we moved down to Orange County from Los Angeles, and we just call it Recovery for Everyone, um, because recovery is so tainted by the association with those loser addicts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only people that came were people that were in recovery from addiction to substances, you know, alcohol and other drugs. I was addicted to everything. Um, but the wish was, and it, we just couldn't find an audience, the wish was to open it up, whether it's recovery from other addictive behaviors, which we all have. There was a recent study in the US, 90% of American adults say they have at least one behavioral addiction going on right now. 
whether it's mm. overeating or undereating, overspending, you know, all the things, you know, all kinds of sexual addictions, et cetera. That's us as humans, but also addictive. And you've made reference earlier to ideology, Kara, I think addictive attitudes, addictive ideologies, a Guy Duplessis, who you know, and has been on your program. I'm hearing him tomorrow about it. Uh, yeah, that's Guy's specialty is ideological addiction. And I live in the U.S. I mean, say no more. <laughs> Jesus, God, the, the partisan well, shit that goes, 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 goes for our national political scene. And so why, why, what, would, what would be so wrong about opening up recovery truly to be universal? Every one of us, you know, the, the root word for addiction comes from the Latin term addictus, and addictus in Latin means slave. We all know what it's like to be enslaved to patterns of behavior, perhaps some portion of 25% of Americans over the age of 12 are addicted to substance. That's one out of four. That's 80 million Americans are addicted just to substance. I guess we can open up the conversation to include 80 million people. If 90% of us are addicted to other behaviors, 100% of us are addicted to ideologies or you know, batshit crazy attitudes. So what would be so wrong about leveling the playing field? And I feel like I'm with you, Amy, and you, Kara. Last night when, uh, when you guys were doing the interview and I reviewed it this morning, my eyes filled with tears for gratitude for whatever it is that got me to a place to get into recovery uh, and it's recovery of everything. It's I'm, what I'm wanting to recover is my life. This isn't just recovery from alcoholism or drug addiction or whatever. It's like, I want to recover my life and you you're doing it, Amy and you too, Kara. And why would we want to keep that under a bushel basket? You want to share that with anybody that has ears to hear conceivably every person on the planet is enslaved and could use some liberation. <laughs> or recovery exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. i wrote down earlier um richard granin who i've been following a lot i've sent you some of his videos yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He, he's quite a he's quite a hard ass and um, he he does a lot of uh, stuff on childhood trauma um but yeah. the, the he spoke earlier about um mm. uh covid and using also relating um recovery. i love his vibe i love his hard ass vibe <laughs> just like hardcore but he's running yeah. your face and but some he, he moves it that. from the clouds down to where we live you know yeah. it's really very but he, cool. he helps yeah. um codependents deal with the narcissists and how mm -hmm. and identify yeah. that we've yeah. got to be careful of these narcissists and and also sometimes the codependents can can morph narcissists in the end anyway mm -hmm. but how we, we've got to stand up for ourselves and and, and stop mm -hmm. and also stop falling prey to ideologies um and form our yeah. own ideals anyway mm -hmm. so the one thing he said with with covid and all these issues coming up um whether it's gender-based violence Black Lives Matter, whatever it is, um, he said that humanity is trying to, it's in its um, adolescent phase, or it has been, and now it's trying to grow up. Um, it's like humanity is in its childhood trauma. Um, and it's we're in this like survival oh, beautiful, mentality. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Um, um, so we all need to heal mm. from um, our past illnesses and the ways that we were trying to heal before weren't working. And we said this before in the last, in the last, uh, in our last chat, Dr. Bob. Um, so the only way that we can heal from these past traumas, humanity as a whole, I mean, is by facing the truth, facing our truths authentically, facing our inner demons, um, facing reality. And because people haven't had the access to to or they've tried uh reaching out to government police whatever it is before hasn't worked what are they doing they're imploding <laughs> um and it's all going out all over social media not great because as amy and i spoke about yesterday we, we worry for the people so i mean there's some people who are putting out really traumatic experiences on social media for the first time totally unguided yeah. I don't think that's a good idea but what else can they do um so yeah if psychology way... psychology talks about kind of uncontained trauma you know uh you know amy you know this from your own experience is is you have to be so selective uh, with whom you share this that's that's part of what we've been talking about but also to to work with people that are skillful facilitators for you know, titrating it, gradually going into it because it's overwhelming. It'll overwhelm any of us. So this idea of kind of uncontained runny, trauma running everywhere, it, it's no favor that we do to ourselves. We can absolutely re-traumatize ourselves. So whether it's a conversation like this that's safe 
or a conversation with another skilled helper, whatever that is, I worry about the same thing is uh, uh, you, have to, you have to be so careful because you can just basically uh, imploding in trauma. I, I'll ask some people, I'll say, how do you get somebody over a phobia? Like if somebody's scared of an elevator, how do you get them over it? They say, just make them get on it. And I go, uh, wrong answer. You can freak the shit out of somebody permanently by doing that. You have to very gradually develop that. The man that developed that is South African. <laughs> <laughs> that idea of, of dealing with things gradually. So I'm right with you, Kara, that it needs to be done gradually. I want to ask a question, and it's it just comes literally out of our conversation. Amy, is there any way that Kara and I, through this medium, could support you bringing your experience to people generally? Let me get this. A way to understand what happened to you as being very individual, and it is, it is, the scars, the, the trauma of it, and also that it's part and parcel of a culture, whether it's South African culture, U.S. culture, Western culture, the planet, however we want to look at that, but some way to utilize this conversation, this entry point, which is your own experience and then more largely gender-based violence. My background is in addiction. Uh, we share all of us, all three of us do, some way to talk about how it is that these, I liked how you did it earlier, Amy. They're just like that. Oh, yes, they, the they, not, yeah. not, well, we can talk about the triangle, but, I was in, but how, they, how they converge in a way. I just yeah. want to plant a seed, and it's something that you guys can talk about, but I, I think all roads lead to Rome, and there's a way that what we're talking about is so universal. There's, uh, I know that in the U.S., twice as many women report anxiety as men. Twice as many women report depression as men. Uh, nearly twice as many women have PTSD. I know it's about what we're talking about. And you guys know as well as I that no one can barbecue in their own adrenaline with anxiety, depression, or PTSD without self-medicating. Mm -hmm. So my work is in addiction, but it, it begs the question. The elephant in the room is that we're not discussing is the incredible trauma, structural trauma that goes on. Why are women twice as likely to be depressed, anxious, and PTSD? Well, we're talking into that. And so for me, it gets right into the area that I'm working with because I'm working kind of like, what happens when this isn't dealt with? Well, people get addicted, big surprise. And I, so I just want to plant a seed with you that this not be a single conversation, but that it could be something ongoing. And Amy, that's really dependent on your timing and your needs, because I want to support you. Absolutely. But if, 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 if Kara and, I, and I'm presuming here that Kara might be interested, if Kara and I could help support your voice being a collective expression of the three of us to start with, I do that in a nanosecond. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, um, you know, for year, for the past few years, I've been, it's almost like I, I have an idea of what it is, like on the tip of my tongue. I just don't know exactly what it is, um, what needs to be done, what's the next step. And like you said, it, it all leads to Rome. Like we kind of all know what the, the, the end meaning is. It's just exactly how we get there. Um, so I'm definitely happy to carry these conversations on yeah. in whatever kind of yeah. format or um, yeah. Yeah, any needs or whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. I'm aware. I'm going to have to go in just a moment. So we'll have to wind down. It feels so much like we've just barely gotten started. So that's part of it. But I also feel the gravity, the depth of what we're talking about. Something that you guys got to at the very end of your interview. And by the way, Kara, I'm going to You'll have to help me with this, but I want to upload that interview with your guys' permission to Vitality Project because I literally, I want everybody that's a part of this community to see it. It's just really important. At the very end, I was really touched, Amy, where you began to talk into this whole idea of forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't. And I really am right with you, just the way you articulated that, is that you can think of all the themes that attach to this horrible life devastation, this catastrophe, this huge trauma in your life. And how can we convert that into something that's useful on a larger scale? And I'm not doubting that you've already done that. I just want to help support that. You too, Kara. So it doesn't feel like a niche for me. It feels like it becomes like a strange attractor, a conduit for so many things that matter. And whether it's from a women's perspective, men's perspective, gay's perspective, black's perspective, I don't, you know, it just, you can begin, you begin kind of seeing where this goes and it's huge. And so... Um, I don't want to turn you as a person into a project. So please know that, Amy. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> at all suggesting that. I honor you just as you are. 
but if Amy if, has if, um, yeah. inspired our, our, our new yeah. uh, video yeah. series, um, My Story Unlocked. Um, so she's Wonderful. in the first episode for that with her story, Wonderful. which yeah. I'm hoping will inspire other people, yeah. doesn't matter what yeah. their story is, um, to join in a similar uh, video yeah. chat like Beautiful. this. And Beautiful. If you'd yeah. like to make it a regular thing, Dr. Bob, you can always yeah. be our guided facilitator. Well, um, I, I just feel like a co participant with your co creator for sure. There's something about, you know, in the in the <clears throat> in the uh, French Revolution, the uh, the French uh, uh, essayist Voltaire, he he uttered a war cry to the 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 uh, the, the revolutionaries. They were fighting the aristocracy, they were throwing off the monarchy, and he was afraid that they were going to go back into silence. And so he, his his battle cry was, "Remember the cruelties." remember the cruelties. He did not want them to forget the shit that had gone on that got them to the cusp of being free. And they did, they broke through. Their revolution happened before it happened here in the US, but it, it took being reminded of that. And I think that all of us are subject to cruelties. You've been subject to a specific kind of cruelty that's legion in South Africa. It is here in the US as well. And uh, I, if we can open that into what can we do to destigmatize these kinds of conversations so that we can talk about addiction, so that we can talk about rape without blanching and we just stick with it? I feel like it's a contribution we can make. And anybody that has ears to hear, I would want to share this with them. And I'd want to be a part of that with you, Amy, and you too, Kara. So I plant that seed with you guys. If this is the only time that we're here together, I'm really honored to meet you, Amy, and really bless you in this process. Your courage, your integrity, it's really... It's uh, palpable. It's really amazing. Yeah, tears Thank flowing you. as I say that. Really, really. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, yeah. I actually have court again on Friday, so it's really mm. nice mm. to get that kind of because you know I have to pump myself up before I testify. So this is like mm. perfect timing for all of that. So breathing lots of oxygen your way, and uh, I, 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 I invite you, Amy, to stay in touch also via you, Kara, and then you and I and Jason we can figure out how we want to form this. Amy, this is our first meeting together officially as was it Vitality Project Unlocked. Uh, I, yeah. I, I feel like this topic of, of speaking of the unspeakable, of talking about that which is marginalized, uh, it, it, that's, that's the key underground river. And we can talk about addiction. We can talk about the horrors of rape and all that you've been through. People, when they see the interview, will see all that we haven't gotten to in terms of the hospital system, the legal system, the police, uh, your family, um, our society, all of that stuff is relevant. But I would love for us to continue to, to talk and to speak the unspeakable so that we can begin to uh, uh, maybe hopefully grow some compassion and, and, and also some, some, um, some courage to change what needs to be changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really inspiring to me. The timing is perfect. You're right, Kara. COVID has ripped the scab off, hasn't it? Of so much that's been percolating underneath. And as painful as it is, it's been a long time coming. And I don't want it to go back under. I'm like Voltaire. I want us to remember what we're talking about. I read an essay years ago on forgiveness. And the author said, that, I don't know if you guys have this phrase in, in South Africa. I presume you do. We probably got it from you guys. I grew up with forgive and forget. That's utter bullshit. That's utter oh, bullshit. Thank you. And, we had yeah. this conversation yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so this particular author, who's a, a, a psychologist by background, he said, no, 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 you forgive and remember. You uh -huh. forgive and remember. And the way that you talked at, at the end of your guy's interview last night, of, of I loved how you talked about it, Amy. Forgiveness is an internal process. It's for mm. you. And it isn't this person deserves it. It's relinquishing grievance. But it's not, it's not because they deserve anything. And it doesn't require reconciling. People that are fucked up, people that are perpetrators, people are dangerous, you don't reconcile with them. That's yeah. naive. But we have to reconcile with ourselves. Correct. And I feel like yeah. that these kinds of conversations make that possible. We begin to at least be open and honest. And the three of us can do that. Kara, I, I, you know, we've just gotten to know each other. I trust you implicitly. And I think you have yeah. a sense of who I am. And Amy, your, uh, your transparency with, with all of this is uh, totally honorable. Uh, it's like, how else are we going to change this if we don't have a conversation, if we can't speak about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a scoot for right now. It feels so arbitrary. I'm sorry for this punctuation. I hope that's all it is, is like a semicolon like that. Yeah. <laughs> anything, anything from you, Amy and Kara, as we finish up, you guys have the last word, okay? Anything at all? 
um just from my side thanks for having me um it's been yeah it's been really cool the past couple of days kind of getting to know everyone so it's been really nice thank you thank you thank you so much amy kara mm. yeah uh, just for me again thanks amy for um joining me on this and for sharing your story um and opening up with us and and the platforms and for um being part of the first the first video with me and Dr. Bob. And also um, just as much as we're using um, all these examples of things that have come up in COVID, it's not to minimize the, the COVID itself and um, uh -huh. people who are um, losing family members and um, uh, struggling with, with COVID-19, the coronavirus, I mean, yeah. um, because I know there's stigma associated with that at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I mean, we're all apparently gonna get COVID at some point. Um, well, we hope we don't, but if we do, we should be able to talk about that so let's add that onto the things that we can uh, put on this video chat series um so yeah thank you for this opportunity <laughs> i'll finish with a quote from a poem that's a favorite one of mine and as soon as i share it it's just one line as soon as i share it you'll know that it's autobiographical it's been with me for the last 10 years to try to make sense of my life after uh amy and care after really hitting bottom in a serious serious way where i just lost everything that i valued uh, the, the poet says, a prophet's soul, like a prophet, a prophet's soul, I'm pointing at you, Amy, and you too, Kara, a prophet's soul is especially afflicted because it has to become so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I wish you well this Friday, Amy, okay? Yeah, yeah, really Thank with you. So you. Thank you, Kara. Bless you guys both, okay? We'll see each other again soon, I hope, okay? All right. Yeah, Thank okay. you, guys. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.